Here we have some famous um, gain restatement of many of the things we've discussed. These slides are somewhat repetitive. I just offer them as a way of hopefully at the end of this we'll know what a cloud is. Uh, we have on-demand service, that's the elastic property that we can spin up these virtual machines on demand. We have accessibility from everywhere. We share resources, that's what research pooling means, so we get very big data centers shared between lots of people that produces efficiency and load balancing. We have a very flexible model for allocating resources on demand. And everything can be measured from the smallest uh, micro unit of computing up to, I mean, whatever you like. It's done, that's done somewhat differently in different places, but everything can be measured and locked. And we get economies of scale and performance. And we also get economies in electrical power, because we can place the uh, clouds in places where the power is both environmentally friendly and possibly correspondingly cheap. We have lots of new software models. There's infrastructure as a service, as the classic um, virtual machines. Uh, that's obviously very cloud specific. But we also have platform as a service is built on top of that. Which is, although a lot of the platform parts were built for clouds, they actually run on general clusters. And originally Azure started as platform as a service and Amazon as infrastructure as a service. But now both of them offer both types of clouds. Here's another <coughs> simple definition of a cloud. Scalable, persistent, outsourced infrastructure. Those are words we've seen before. Maybe outsourced is a little different from some of the words we have before, but we know what that means. For a public cloud, you're outsourcing the computer from your data center to Amazon's data center. They support huge big data analysis. We already discussed how they amplify our desktop experience. And we've also discussed that clouds are a data center architecture to produce the world's biggest data centers. Here is a historical view. We started off plugging away with the early versions of um, email and, uh, and then uh, me instant messaging and also the early hosting companies. The first dot com revolution, which sort of ended around 2000. There were lots of web hosting companies supporting those. Um, those dot-com startups. Um, but then this all transitioned into this giant cloud world we see now, which is needed, which effectively encompasses all of web hosting in a few large uh, centers. And they support the search and the Gmail and the Hotmail and et cetera, which we now have as a, uh, a great, great scalable service. And that all came from the fact that you had to serve a lot of users for email. We have to service the half a million photos we upload every day. And we have to do the endless web searches that are made every month. And we not only have to support the users of that web services, we have to crawl the entire web and do it continuously to keep our index up to date. And all of this has to be done, actually, whatever the application, whether it's e commerce, um, Search, social media, you need a response in a fraction of a second. The human brain doesn't do much in a tenth of a second, so it can tolerate those delays very straightforwardly. But it does a lot in 10 seconds and gets really bored if you have to wait that length of time. And it also gets bored when the systems crash. I mean, better make certain we have fault tolerance so we don't crash. And those are these big cloud data centers satisfy these requirements. Here's a, st here's a comment about uh, clouds versus company-owned data centers. Those company-owned data centers might, of course, be set up as a private cloud. Um, that's not, not really discussed here, but because um, that's the first step. You go from traditional data centers, private data centers, public data centers. And here, this fellow from Amazon who's slightly biased because he runs a public data center. and. Um, he thinks that public data centers have advantages, which will make them um, take over. So that says, um, here's an interesting thing, security advantage of shared systems. Many people will say the security disadvantages. There are disadvantages from sharing, because you have some security problems. There's some advantages that you can have very professional, high quality solutions. Clouds have a natural distributed architecture, because they Amazon hides the fact that their data centers are distributed from you. 
and um, you do not have to, and they also hide the changing in architecture, because all that happens underneath the hood. Um, you just uh, rent the machines you want. And in principle, if you have enough money, you can actually get a supercomputer on demand. And uh, that can be done. You set up your new company, you're going to have millions of early users. You can do that straightforwardly on a commercial cloud. Whereas in the old days of around 2000, when you had to actually buy your own hardware and possibly putting it in a hosting company, that was not possible. You could not, you had to waste a lot of money uh, to buy your initial computers, and they, either they were too many or too little, neither of which was satisfactory. And uh, they're supporting the mobile world, but well, that's even more true than when this, uh, these comments are made, because it gets more and more true every day. The mobile computing is getting more and more important, and desktop computing is getting less and less important. And um, if you look at uh, some of the key features of clouds, there's another Microsoft from a talk from um, the Azure architect, uh, Khalidi. Uh, we need scale, it's necessary to get the economies, the elasticity, and the, the natural sharing of lots of people. Only possible if your systems are large, if they're small, none of this works. Um, and you have to share these resources among a lot of customers to be able to afford it. You need to be able to do virtualization, which is this uniformity. You need the fung fungibility, maybe you can need to take a resource here, working for customer A, and then make it work for customer B, and A comes along later and uses a system over here. And virtualization is necessary, but not sufficient here. Because you have to work on a lot of other problems, like the fault tolerance issue, which are not immediately addressed by virtualization. So that's the end of that lesson on what is a cloud. Now we come on to a little discussion from Gartner, which we actually um, initiated in the introduction about uh, the emerging technology landscape. Here we focus on Gartner's uh, predictions not for the general technology landscape, but for clouds and big data. Let's uh, well now go. Why don't you go on to that nice, exciting new lesson? Thank you.